so uh, very much for coming out tonight and being here for this, in many ways, improbable story, though if I do anything tonight, perhaps I will convince you that it's much more probable than you think it is. This is a, a very rare place in politics and prose, as many of you know, because it's not only unbelievably rare in that it is a place of great thought, but it is actually one of the rarest places of all. It is a place of contemplation, which is something that I, any of us in the internet world really appreciate when we can find it. Uh, the staff here has just been unbelievable. I want to thank you, and Susan, you in particular. You've just been getting such a support throughout this, and I can't thank you overall. And again, I just want to thank you. It really is wonderful that you've given the time to come here and being open to this subject. I'd like a particular shout out to the young people here, and I have a specific comment for you guys in the end, so bear with me, but I think it's particularly important because the people I'm about to describe to you are only three or four or five years older than you, so I think it's wonderful that you're uh, doing that overall. I'd also like you, before I get started, just to keep focus from time to time. If I get boring, just go look at this photograph and try to contemplate the photograph as much as you can, and particularly young people, and I'm going to come back to it a little bit further. As Susan alluded, it may seem particularly jarring to talk about something hopeful in the Middle East today. We all here, right now, are awaiting decisions which, if nothing else, are painfully familiar to the 20th century. Uh, well, I'm here to describe new forces of the 21st. But that strange, counterintuitive, even conflicting things coexist may in fact be the hallmark of our times. We are a very narrative animal. We love stories. It's very natural us to be beholden to our stories. As the great theologian uh, Reinhold Niebuhr said in a different context, it's when we are uncertain that we often become doubly certain. And I think that's a risk that we have to watch in this because it is natural for us to be this way. And it allows us to miss, I would suggest, significant change that is happening in the midst, in our midst. I'll give you an example of this. This summer, we all heard about and are hearing about right now terrible violence re-rising in Iraq. Few of us know that one of the largest tech IPOs, initial public offerings, where companies sell public traded stocks, was in fact AsiaCell, which is the mobile provider in Iraq. It went public in the first quarter this year for a valuation of over five and a half billion dollars. And even in the midst of the chaos that is happening now, its stock price has held up and it's just having an incredible impact not only in Iraq but beyond. When most of us, or I can tell you before I got into all of this, when I think about Saudi Arabia, I usually think first and foremost that if nothing else, it is a place where women cannot drive. It seems impossible that it is also the largest, the largest on a per capita basis, consumer viewer of YouTube. And what is even more interesting is that one of the largest demographics of Saudis watching YouTube are women. And even more interesting is the largest category of content that they're watching is education. They're finding education and teaching themselves. Egypt's political instability is profound. The violence is terrible. Uh, Leslie Jump is here, who's a great entrepreneur and has been very valuable in being a venture capitalist in Egypt. She and I know two entrepreneurs who were killed last week or two weeks ago in Egypt. This is very real at the same time. Egypt has the largest population of internet and mobile users in the Middle East, with one of the largest youth populations in the world. It's a large consumer market in the early days of e-commerce, and one day it will be, so help me, once again, a global tourist destination. Last month, in an incredible time of uncertainty, exports rose, rose 25% year over year. Pent up demand, people ask about, because there is much activity that's on the sidelines. All it took was a coup for the stock market to rise 10%, and on and on and on. Look, I can't tell you what's going to happen tomorrow or in the next six months in the Middle East. The terrible scenarios are there, and we all in this room know them well, and they are terribly, terribly real. But I can tell you that within three years, there is going to be a lot, and I mean a lot, more technology in the hands of a lot more people throughout the region. Right now as I speak, and Booz and Company and Google just did a study, said that in the Arab world among young people, people under 35, internet users are growing 23% uh, per year. That compares to 14% around the entire globe, not just developed nations, but the entire globe. Of those people online, 83% use the internet daily, half of them five hours a day. A whopping 78% prefer the internet to television and 40%, which will be important when I spoke, speak about this in a moment, 40% say they intend to start their own business sometime in the next year or two. They are spending in the Middle East over a billion dollars online, which most experts think will double within the next two to three years. 
The offline retail space, just to put it in context, is roughly $425 billion. And fewer than 15% of the businesses in the Arab world overall even have online presences yet. So think about the ramifications of that with some time. Two-thirds of people go online in the Middle East to research their offline purchases. Now, in the forum of my book, a wonderful, remarkable man named Mark Andreessen, who some of you will remember was the founder of Netscape. He literally invented the browser. There was no browser before Mark Andreessen, and he's now one of the most admired, admired venture capitalists uh, in Silicon Valley. He predicts that within a decade, there are going to be over 5 billion smartphones around the world. 5 billion smartphones. I can tell you that in my own research, mobile providers told me when I was over there that they expect 50% penetration, meaning 50% of people in Egypt will have smartphones. And by the way, right now in many Gulf countries, they've already surpassed this number. Now, as many of you know, smartphones are not just phones. They are not merely highfalutin telephones and telephony. They are certainly not just entertainment devices, though they assuredly are that. But stop and think about what they really are. These are supercomputers, literally the computing capacity that put a man on the moon in the pockets of billions of people around the world. This means billions of people are going to have at their fingertips, and essentially for free, most of the world's collective knowledge. This means billions will have the ability to affordably connect, share, collaborate, and reach markets unthinkable less than a decade before. Something, I suggest, good has got to come from this. Problem solving and innovation is going to change. In fact, as I'll tell you, they are changing, and it's happening bottom up. If you remember me for nothing else today, please remember me for this. The change is happening bottom up. It's not being dictated top down. In fact, so often what I see is the top down doesn't even know what's happening. We know this is real because it's happened here in the West. We know it's real because it's happened in South America, Asia, India, Eastern Europe. And here's a mind blow for you who do not know this. If I were to ask you what is a country that is the number one mobile payment country on the planet, how many of you would be able to guess it is Kenya? Kenya, which has a terrible banking system, but everybody has a dumb phone, not even a smartphone, developed through their mobile provider an incredible texting capability by which cash can be moved across the entire country. I will put it in perspective. 20% of the entire GDP of Kenya passes through the texting capability in that country, Africa. All of these countries, I will suggest to you, and many of you have been to many of them and love them as I do, know that they wrestle their own legacies, oppression, top-down control, corruption, and worse. But something is happening in all of them, something familiar to all of us, and it is no surprise, or it should be no surprise, that's happening in the Middle East as well. How did I come to this? I'm not an expert in the Middle East. I traveled as a tourist before all this happened. I have been in technology for over a decade, and I've traveled all over the world. I've outsourced tech to Argentina, Estonia, India, Israel. My narrative of the Middle East, my story of the Middle East, was very narrow. I was raised in New York City at a time when pretty much if you thought about the Middle East at all, you either thought about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict or the Iranian hostage crisis. And pretty much everything else was noise to us in some way. And of course, in recent years, it's been about the wars. But I had my first aha moment about something happening in the world changed dramatically in 2005. I used to run all the online businesses for the Washington Post and Newsweek. And Don Graham, who's just an amazing, as you all know, is the owner and the founder of the Post until recently. And he's a very visionary guy. He thought forward. And he asked if I'd be willing to go to Korea and Japan to see what was going on in 2005 with the amazing technology that's there, this amazing broadband that you've read about and mobile devices back then seemed to be unprecedented everywhere else. A friend of mine once said that the definition of a futurist is anyone who's been in Asia in the last six months. And I think a little bit in that spirit, he had asked me to do this. Now, I have to tell you, I went to Korea and I went to uh, Tokyo, and it was unbelievable. And I got off the plane so prepared to be overwhelmed by what I was going to see, so prepared to see everything technology, a Jetsons-like world of lights buzzing and flashing the minute you get off the plane, that I was completely and utterly unprepared to see nothing. I saw nothing. And what I mean by that is technology had become like water. It was assumed like electricity. It was merely something to be harnessed. 
I saw then, before they were big here, some of the social networks and e-commerce plays that have become very popular in the United States. Mobile usage was very powerful before it became as powerful here. But I knew something different was happening, and I began to wonder if it could actually happen everywhere. Move the clock up to 2010. Some very dear friends of mine who are business executives have been talking to me about this phenomenon happening in the Arab world. And I have to tell you that I all but summarily rejected everything they said for the reasons of my own bias that I described to you before. And they put their monies where their mouth was, and they held what was one of the first big gathering of tech entrepreneurs in the Middle East, which they called Celebration of Entrepreneurship. And in many respects, I can tell you my worldview has changed from before that event and after that event. It just changed completely the way that I looked at the world. Because I was unprepared for 2,400 young people from North Africa to Yemen. Nobody wanted to talk about politics. Nobody cared about Obama's Cairo speech. These people from the first thing in the morning till the end of the day want to figure out how to build things and to solve problems and to brainstorm and go online to do it. There was a waiting list of 2,000 other young people trying to get into it. They cared about the success or failure of their startup and knew they were up to something very, very powerful. To give you just a small, small sense of what I found there, you know, I went and I spoke and it was lovely and then you do different kinds of things and they broke out into these mentoring sessions where, you know, the great gringo shows up from Silicon Valley experience and gets to talk to people about what they know and all. And so they put you in a room of maybe six or seven young people and they'd ask you all sorts of questions very respectfully about how to think of their company. Their questions were as good as anything I'd ever heard anywhere else. Their ideas were as good as anything I'd seen anywhere else in the world. As if on cue, while I was sitting there, a flowing figure in black glided before me like a phantom. She sat beside me, shoulders proudly back, dressed in the traditional head-to-toe abaya that revealed only her face and her hands. She said she was a university student in Saudi Arabia, and while there had been she had there, she had designed a luxurious leather carrying case for mobile devices like smartphones and iPads, complete with a battery pocket to keep them charged. She asked me whether I thought it was a good idea. Now, the whole scene just freaked me out. This was nothing that I, she, I can't, I don't write well enough to convey that the way she was right up in my grid and her shoulders were back and she was looking right at me in this. So fumbling for a coherent answer, I asked a couple of questions about her background and the genesis of her idea and I offered her some generic advice and encouragement about following her dreams, yada, yada, yada. She nodded very politely but with a palpable sense of boredom and I cannot tell you how bored this woman looked at my wisdom. She said, thank you for that, sir. It's very helpful but I should have been more precise. I have a pre-order for 1,000 units, and this leaves me with a very important business dilemma. There are four, four low-cost cost manufacturers in China who are enthusiastic about doing business with me, but I'm nervous about having my suppliers so far away. Should I risk manufacturing my idea with people I don't know very well, or should I raise the roughly 45,000 US dollars I'd need for machinery and then hire a young woman I know locally to handle production? And I looked at her, and I said, I have a problem with my business. And I would like your opinion. <laughs> I extended this trip then and there, and I saw more of the same in Amman and in Cairo. And for a host of reasons, and Leslie played a very significant role in this, I was invited back to judge a startup competition in January 2011, where they come and they pitch their business ideas, and you review them in a lot of different ways. And it was the same thing. It was just awesome. These young people were awesome, and they just want to take the world by storm. And it should therefore be no surprise that every one of them the next week was in Tahrir Square. And the rest, as we say, is history. I'm often asked if the rise of tech entrepreneurship in the Middle East happened as a result of the Arab uprisings, but I think people miss that this has been happening for a long time. And in fact, they're not separate events. In this town, we love to kind of bifurcate or trifurcate things, right? There's this thing called business over here, and there's this thing called policy over here, and there's this thing called governance over here, and over there somewhere way out west, there's this thing called Silicon Valley technology. We like to break them up, but they're not break upable any longer. They're part and parcel of the same desire, I would argue, to have a voice. The uprisings themselves were about political, societal, even cultural voice. These entrepreneurs, I would say, are about their economic futures. They know, the data is clear, that traditional business and government and their parents will not solve their needs quickly enough. So, they are taking matters into their own hands. Now, who are these people? I broke them down into three categories, but there's cross in many, many different ways. But the first, for anyone who spent time in emerging markets, is actually a very common story. I call them the improvisers. Other people call them copycats, which I think is an unnecessarily pejorative term because they're not just copying ideas that have worked elsewhere, but they're making them very important and valuable to the region. So Maktoub, 
for lack of a better description, is the Yahoo of the Middle East, which, by the way, several years ago, Yahoo bought for almost $200 million. And it is one of the fastest growing parts of their business even to this day. A fantastic company there is called Souk.com. Souk, like marketplace. Souk.com is a multi-hundred million dollar company now that's effectively the Amazon of the Middle East. And this is a market of 350 million people, many of whom are great consumers. Their potential there is wonderful. I have to tell you that personally, while as an investor, those kinds of companies are intriguing to me, because again, like Russia and China, the first great tech companies that came were like search engines of those countries and that kind of stuff. You get that. It takes a bit of the risk out of it and everything else. But I was both moved economically but deeply moved personally by a group that I would call the problem solvers. And there's an amazing phenomenon in emerging markets, but I think it's even happening in the United States now, where the lines between entrepreneurship to make money and what is often called social entrepreneurship begins to blur. And what I mean by that is nobody wants to make less money, but they know that in the way they run their businesses or the problems that are not being addressed by traditional means can be solved with technology. So if you're in Cairo, any of you have been to Cairo, traffic makes Los Angeles look like an empty park. I mean, it's just terrible. So my generation would say that's an infrastructure problem. This generation says it's a software problem. We're not going to build new roads. What we are going to build is a crowd-sharing app. And millions of people can say at any given moment was the fastest route to navigate your way around Cairo. That would be a problem that they would solve. Recycling is a huge issue there. It's in the early days of it overall. And particularly tough, believe it or not, is waste of computers and consumer electronics. They really don't have a good way to do it. So this young engineering kid in the city of Tanta, which I bet most of you don't know, because it's not Alexandria and it is not Cairo, was on a website and saw this wonderful video that taught him that Asians love, love, to be able to take components of computers and consumer electronics. And he figured out if he could build a platform where people could deliver hardware, he could break it up, sell the scrap for scrap, and make a lot of money selling the replaceable parts to the Asian market overall. And he did this literally all online, moved the company to Cairo where he is now looking at that problem. Healthcare. There are a billion companies doing amazing things in health and other stuff like that. But I must tell you that of this moving category, what has moved me most are people who have been coming after education. Again, my age or older, they look at the education problems in the Middle East, and they are real, right? It actually surprised me, and some of you who are experts in the region more than I may have known this already, but there's actually a tremendous amount, on a per capita basis, a tremendous amount of money spent on education throughout the Middle East, but it's just spent terribly. It is rote learning that makes Asian rote learning look like poetry, and it's often the kinds of things that you really don't need to learn for the 21st century economy. Schools have problems with attendance and crime. Classes can be 70 students and this kind of thing. So what ends up happening is that, particularly in places like Egypt, tremendous amount of money is put into supplemental education. Literally, people who are spending billions of dollars in aggregate to be able to supplement education. Well, of course, what's the best way to supplement education? Not just for a few rich people who can afford tutors, but for the masses. And that is the word MOOC. This is the ability to bring education online to many, many people overall. This is, as one young man said to me, as they hack the culture. Uh, Leslie's partner is a wonderful man named Ahmed Alfi, who's founded incubators there. And he said to me, you didn't have to be a math whiz to figure out that the government would have to build a few schools per day for the next five years to keep up with the numbers of the youth bulge, which is another issue I'll come back to. And the odds of this were not very high. By the way, he told me this yet again when we were stuck in a car in traffic in Cairo without our app. He was intrigued by the rise of online courses for kids around the world, and he decided to ask his driver right then and there about the concept. Now, he expected his driver, like any working man, would simply be pleased to have supplemental education and not have to pay for private lessons, because assuming this would be much cheaper than having a tutor overall. Private tutoring to compensate for mediocre schooling, as I'd mentioned, is literally a 2 to $3 billion business overall. Alfie was stunned by what he heard. The driver said say three things to him. First, so my wife can learn at the same time as the kids? I really want to talk to her more about things in life, but she doesn't read very well, can't really read a newspaper, but this might be an opportunity for her and the family, right? Secondly, can one of the women in our building use these videos and take the elementary school kids and help them with their lessons as a group? That would be very helpful, I think, too. Third, can my son really learn at home instead of going to school all the time? Sometimes he gets beaten up there and there's no place for him to sit. Alfie paused and reflecting on this reaction, looked me straight in the eye and said, I decided then and there I was going to launch a company. His company, Nafham, has now over 8,000 crowdsourced courses, classes on video in Arabic. And this is one of literally dozens, if not hundreds, of this type that I've seen and very powerful. 
The third group that I'm very impressed with I'll call the global players. Global players know that the entire world is at their fingertip one click away for free. Leslie and I were being pitched by a wonderful entrepreneur from uh, Alexandria, Egypt, who was describing what has become the highest paid weather app in the world. As he was describing it, I looked down at my iPad and realized that I had downloaded it six months earlier. I had no idea it was 30 young people in Alexandria, Egypt who did it, but there are now five, six, seven million people around the world who have it because they can, because it's one click away. This amazing woman that I met was a college swimmer, very successful college swimmer, I think at AUB, but certainly in, in Lebanon. And it drove her crazy that all the devices to help monitor her training were based on people who went running. So as you can imagine, if you're trying to swim and train, you don't want to be looking at your wrist as you come around and everything else. So she developed what is effectively a Google Glass with a little monitor on your side in your goggles so you can look up and see your heart rate and everything else. She's outsourced manufacturing to China. It is going to be launched in the United States en masse later this fall. It's unbelievable. People are being innovative in mobile. As I mentioned before, mobile is incredibly powerful. And if you've been to the region, there's a lot of sun there. And what you might not know is that one of the largest, the largest collection of fresh water in the world is in the desert below Egypt and Libya. The only problem is getting to it. Right now it's gotten to through what was once heavily subsidized diesel fuel and individual pumping, highly unreliable in delivery. One young entrepreneur who's just doing amazing things said, this ain't gonna work. And by the way, diesel subsidies are gonna go away, which they have. He predicted this exactly right. So he and some partners have developed a technology by which independent farmers can use solar panels and solar technology to dig down and pump out the water. He believes that there could be as much as 20% more arable land in Egypt in the next five to 10 years with access to the aquifers. And by the way, the aquifers won't last forever. The same kind of technologies are being brought to bear for desalinization. So very, very powerful things, I think, in this area. Clearly a surprise to most people that I talk to in the West here is that while studies back this up, I can tell you it's true anecdotally to all the large gatherings that I go to, a third of the entrepreneurs I see are women. And talking to them is just unbelievable because some of the women entrepreneurs that I talk to, when I've asked them a little bit about being a woman entrepreneur in the Middle East, bristle. How dare you ask me that question, they say. I am not a woman entrepreneur, I'm an entrepreneur. I face all the challenge that entrepreneurs face anywhere, and that's all I want to talk to you about. Other women will talk to you what it's like to have men in a venture capital setting talk down to them and look down to them, not even take the meetings in some conservative cultures and all. But what they will also say is, what is the definition, Chris, of an entrepreneur? It's working on round challenges. That's all we've done. Candidly, most of the men around here are kind of lazy. They don't know how to do what we know how to do. We know how to do this. And that's why they're doing, I think, some very powerful things. There are bottom-up activities of mass scale of people who gather at large events. There are amazing small gatherings that happen in very interesting ways. Leslie is a member of the board of a group called Startup Weekend. Startup Weekend in, uh, goes around the world, literally. It actually does, it offers a platform which people around the world grab a hold of it and have their own gathering of entrepreneurs to help teach each other, build companies, and build ideas overall. Mercy Corps and uh, Startup Weekend just did the most recent one in the Middle East. And how many of you would guess that the last Startup Weekend, this last weekend, was in Gaza? 250 entrepreneurs in tech in Gaza that were described to me as absolutely phenomenal. Global investors from Google to Inst in Intel, all the major players are there in big ways, not only sales operations, but helping the ecosystem. And more and more Western investors are beginning to take a look, at least at Istanbul, as a step to the Middle East. And while obviously very cautious of what's happening right now, are watching the basic dynamics of the market and wondering if this could be another interesting opportunity with time. It is amazing stuff, and yet, can these amazing people, by the thousands, I would suggest hundreds of thousands, change societies there in the midst of the 20th century narratives that we know so well? It would be ignorant, it would be silly for me to ignore the headwinds that these amazing people meet, but they are headwinds which I think are found in the emerging markets everywhere. The emerging markets ain't easy stuff. They are not for the lighthearted. But you all have seen the statistics because you read these things, the rise of the middle class, and the shifts and change in access to technology are absolutely unbelievable. Governments still matter, and governments are making choices, and not all of them are good. Obviously, the terrible choices of Syria go without saying, and I can tell you heartbreakingly, some of the most amazing entrepreneurs I met January before hell broke loose were in Damascus, and that's the extreme of it. But even governments that seem to give lip service to the tech ecosystem overall 
are doing things like restricting the internet and access in very powerful ways. But I can tell you the young people are not waiting. I can tell you that I remember that when there were those terrible attacks at Benghazi that we know well, the same day there were those terrible attacks in Cairo, I got a phone call from a New York Times reporter who effectively said to me, so you're done now, right? You can't possibly be talking about tech startups and the environment. So I asked the journalist, I said, how many people were involved in these terrible attacks? And he said, I don't know, maybe it was 2,000 people collectively among the both. And of course, we all know subsequently it's probably about 250 people. These are terrible attacks, right? I'm not denigrating them. I said to him, four months early, I was in Beirut as a judge for the MIT startup competition. It was 6,000 companies representing 14,000 entrepreneurs from North Africa to Yemen. 42% of them were women. That is happening too. Similarly, during those enormous protests that began in December in Cairo and everyone began to say it can't happen anymore, I got a phone call from a very good friend of mine who's a great Silicon Valley success, but he's Egyptian by birth and is doing amazing things there. And he gave me a phone call from a very different kind of gathering in Cairo while hundreds of thousands of people were in Tahrir Square. He was at a Cairo TEDx. For those of you who don't know what TED is, TED is this amazing gathering of thousands of people that happened out in California from around the world where they talk about big ideas and thinking about new things. And like Startup Weekends, they break out in little cities. Big cities have their own versions of these breakout sessions about them overall. Nearly 1,400 entrepreneurs were attending the Cairo TEDx when hundreds of thousands were in the street. One of the thousands of global sessions spun out by this great TED gathering. He said to me, my time in Cairo was the perfect dichotomy of what is going on today. People live normally and do business as usual. Then they go to Tahrir Square or to the presidential palace to do their political participation. On TV, we see one million people. It's a lot. The Cairo, remember, is nearly 20 million. So the rest of us are at work or at school or we're at TEDx. He laughed. TEDx, he said, was incredible. Look, on top of the 1,400 people in the room, there were hundreds, maybe thousands, on beanbag chairs in the lobbies watching the presentations. There were over 50,000 viewers watching the sessions streamed live. I can't tell you how many have watched them subsequently. The speakers were very eclectic, with a doctor talking about telemedicine in Egypt, a lawyer talking about women's rights, thinkers, writers, innovators. The youth have dropped their fear, and that is reflected in their demands for freedom, career choices, and this wave of entrepreneurship. There is no going back. There is no going back. Last word about the women in this photograph. It's a wonderful organization called Injaz Al-Arab. And Injaz Al-Arab is a little bit like the Junior League. But one of the things that they've done that's very unique in the region for now 15 years or more is they host entrepreneurship classes in schools around the entire region. And over a million kids have gone through these programs over the last decade or so. Uh, this last year, I think they may have as many as 30 or 50,000 at any given time. They host, which is one of my favorite events in the Middle East, which is the high school startup competition where kids come from all over the region to pitch these unbelievable ideas of innovation. Some of them are tech-oriented, some of them are enabled by tech, some of them are even not particularly tech, but they're just a mind blow overall. The winners of 2012 were these five young women in high school who normally dress the way you dress, but they knew they were finalists, so they put on the greatest garb of their people that they could because they're from Yemen. They knew that one of the biggest problems in the villages near them that were tents was that there were fires from kerosene lamps. And they said, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could harness solar power to bring solar power lighting to these people, and that would solve the fire problem overall. So they went to work. And lo and behold, they built solar panels to charge doing charging stations so the town could replace what it did with these no capacities and everything else. A mind blow. So I thought to myself, I said, you know, how is this possible, really? I mean, they're in Yemen. Like, I don't, what the hell is this? So one of the judges turned to them and said, but let me get this right. So you put together a lot of components and pieces of things that you found, right? I mean, that's what you did. And what, would you get the, you must have gotten the solar panels from some NGO or something like that. It's like, oh, no, 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 we, we made them. He said, what do you mean you made them? I said, yeah, we, no, no, we made them. I said, what do you mean? So it took, him, it took us 10 months. And he said, what do you mean you made them? He said, well, you go on YouTube. There are videos about how to make solar panels all over the place. <laughs> and, and internet classes, everything else. It takes you time. We made a lot of mistakes. But literally, Google solar panels, materials in your neighborhood, and you can build those things. And another girl jumps up and says, yeah, we made smaller ones. We put them umbrellas so people walking around the sun could have fans going on in this area and everything else. <laughs> I just close by saying my kids are here in the audience who are these kids' ages. Take note. <laughs> Thank you very much for listening.
I, you just started to touch on this in a comment about a minute ago or so, and that is, um, I'm wondering how far beyond technology does this entrepreneurial spirit uh, go? Do you have any knowledge of that? Obviously, your <coughs> focus has been tech, but um, is so, it a, is this? How much is this phenomenon a reflection of uh, things that are special about technology and its grip on people? How much of it is specific to just the kind of the situation, the social situation in the Middle East, and their interest in getting ahead in the world and so forth? So it's a wonderful question. He asked how much of this is just a tech phenomenon as opposed to something broader entrepreneurship. I can tell you, well-intended but ham-fisted, the most frustrating comment that American diplomats will often make when they come to the region is that the number one export from America is entrepreneurship, to which you look at people in the audience bristle like this, and we've been entrepreneurs for 5,000 years. What are you telling me this is your export? And so part of the question is that the entrepreneurial spirit among all these communities I've met and anywhere in the world are unbelievable. One of the most interesting series of interviews that I did for the book wasn't just the people in the region, but I actually spent two weeks in Silicon Valley interviewing my friends for some of their perspective and how it looks to them. And one of the great legends out there from a, a firm called Sequoia Ventures, Mike Moritz, said to me, Chris, I've been around the world. We've invested in companies around the world. When you get great entrepreneurs in a room, they're the same people. They solve problems the same way. They look at the world the same ways. They want to go at things and solve them immediately. It's, he said it's unbelievable. Different cultures than everything else. So I think overall that's something that's unbelievably there. What I'd say on the technology part of it, which is so interesting to me, is that some of these enterprises and some of the really interesting ones going forward are absolutely tech-based companies. But almost every company is a tech company in some form. And what I mean by that is that when 50% to 100% of people were walking around with smartphones, they're using it. So I did not focus on this in my book, but there's been a long tradition in Egypt, for an example, of women who are at home who have little craft businesses and will bring other people in the community to come. All of a sudden, they've got ability to sell their crafts at distances they never thought they could do three to four years ago. So it is a phenomenon that can be tech-centric, enabled by tech, but I think at some point it becomes like water. I have a favorite phrase. It's essentially, Yankee, go home, but take me with you. And the hardball question for you is uh, Siemens made a lot of money, but it also had to buy people off. So the real problem is uh, corruption. How do you deal with that on all levels? How do you provide proper security? Uh, the Middle East deals with not habeas corpus, but habeas corpse. And the, the biggest of all is tolerance, um, and especially in places like Saudi Arabia. So I guess I could throw something back to you. Jeff Bezos uh, made a lot of money by not paying taxes, as well as uh, by uh, uh, minimizing uh, expenses to people who wanted to buy products or essentially copying stuff. But the, the, the real hardball stuff would have been not just the Middle East, but how would you have saved the post? Ah, uh, uh, that, that's no. <laughs> that, the, the, the post is being saved by the courage of its owners who made a decision with one of the great thinkers about where the world is going, so I'm not worried about the post being saved, but thank you for asking that. Um, look, the fact is, as I said from the beginning of this, the things that make difficult things in emerging markets are very real there. There's a wonderful word which, though I knew the concept, I'd never heard the word. And these kids at the American University of Beirut used it with me. I said, what drives you craziest about being where you are right now for all the ambition and ideas that you have? And like the, like the Andrew sister, I mean, they all just came out of one shot and said, WASTA, WASTA. And some of you, I, you know what WASTA means. And it's effectively, it's, it's who do you know, right? I mean, the whole thing is like, who do you know? Who makes that phone call to get you your job and everything else? And it's not just about getting the job, right? WASTA is a, is a terrible cancer. It means that when you're in a company, someone may be above you forever because they're predicted. Someone very amusingly <laughs> said to me, he said, you know, if you ever get, let me tell you how WASTA works. He says, if you ever get in a position in an airport or somewhere where security is giving you a hard time, he said, take out your mobile phone and pretend to call someone. Because in the end of the day, they assume you probably do and they'll back off. Because that's the theory of WASTA, which is I'm going to know somebody bigger than him and do it. And that is a form of corruption. And it's a corruption of even the soul and everything else. So one of my favorite lines in all of my research in this was a great man who was a leader. He was a, a, a pioneer entrepreneur before a lot of people had done this. He built a company called Aramex, which is effectively the FedEx of the Middle East and Africa. And now he's like a godfather. He's giving back. He's like the godfather of the tech ecosystem there, a man named Fadi Gondor. He's just a, uh, not met three businessmen like him anywhere else. We were having this conversation. He said, Chris, remember, if you remember nothing else, there is no WASTA on the Internet. 
And what he meant by that is that transparency is so high, accountability is so quick, people talk about things that you can't pull the stunts the way that you did. And I'll give you another great example of this. Six, seven months ago, for the first time, LinkedIn opened offices in the Middle East. Like, you think this is a very big deal, it's a big statement, except for one thing. The day they opened their offices, almost six million Arabs were already on LinkedIn before they got there. And he did not use the term, there's no wasta, but he made very clear to me, LinkedIn is about who you are. This is your record. This is what people think about you. You cannot hide. And I think these kinds of things, enabled by technology, will come out the corruption areas, not just like places in the Middle East, but are doing amazing things elsewhere. I can tell you that in Uganda, for example, there's this amazing social entrepreneur who is using texting capability to allow people to report anonymously sexual harassment. And he said to me, he said, you know, I really am a journalist, I think. He said, I built this platform so that people could do this. We could hold people accountability, and they'd have to go investigate. I'd follow up. And all of a sudden, I realized people are using this to share, like, daily information about society. So these issues of corruption, all these things are very, very real. And God knows the criminality of the Syrian regime is just terrible. Sectarian violence is terrible. But something else is also happening. And that's what I think is worthy of consideration as well. Hi, good evening, Mr. Schroeder. Thank you again for being here. Uh, I just here. returned from a year in Saudi Arabia working over there, and one of the huge barriers to our success was a government that was at best inefficient, at worst rather oppressive. And um, with all the problems that we experienced working with there, getting people to even get out of bed in the morning to, to show up, um, and dealing with uh, government oversight, government censorship of the Internet, to what degree do you think that governments in the region will be willing to, at best, uh, provide entrepreneurs with the tools they need to succeed, and at worst, I guess, just even be willing to get out of their way. I'm going to actually kick that question to you in a second, Shelley, because you know very well a lot of the views on it. I will give you just sort of a quick reaction overall. Sure. Again, these are very real issues. And you look at a place particularly like Saudi Arabia with unbelievable amount of wealth, some amazing entrepreneurs, that still puts half of its population at bay. I mean, I, I did this, and I actually thought about not doing this because it's controversial, and I certainly am not an expert in the subject. But I wrote... What does religion mean in the ecosystem? And the question I was asking was not a theological one because I'm not capable of having that conversation. I was asking it as an entrepreneur. If that you are living in a society where hierarchy is everything, you have to file, follow hierarchy, which is the opposite of being a great startup. If, in fact, you don't value all the best talent equally, what does this mean for the ecosystem? And it actually ended up being one of the most interesting chapters in the book because people talked about this in very popular ways. Saudi Arabia is going to be making some choices. They'll get this or they won't. The one thing that I say keeps propping them up, and Shelley, I'd like to defer to you, is that um, they have an awful lot of money. So I can tell you every e-commerce company that I met anywhere in the region is trying to figure out how to do business in Saudi Arabia. And maybe that will help things rise in very, very interesting ways. The United States government frustratingly has tried to figure out, and often with not enough resources, how to engage in this bottom-up phenomenon. I mean, it's still a lot of very Cold War mentality, which is very top-down, big multi-hundred million dollar aid programs and everything else. In the midst of this, a wonderful man named Stephen Kultai, who then left the State Department and was replaced by a wonderful woman, Shelley here, came into the Global Entrepreneurship Program to really try to help build these ecosystems and connections to the West. So before you ask your question, would you mind answering his? And then I'd love your, whatever your question might be. Shelley Porges, thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for uh, the kudos. Um, you know, we're really excited about what Chris has done here. And I, by the way, no longer am at the State Department, left in April. Just to be clear, I don't represent the State Department anymore. Um, but we're very excited about what you've done in, rep you know, reflecting what, it, you know, are some real trends in the region that are going to make a big difference, not only to the region itself, but I think to, to us here in this country. Um, what we found in terms of governments, uh, and, and what we found in terms of people and their motivations, which is key, I think, to your question, is that, for example, in the Gulf states, what, you know, we know that 90% of the populations in most of these Gulf countries are non-nationals. I think you know that in Saudi Arabia. A lot of the work, and that's in fact where we found a lot of the entrepreneurship. Um, so indeed, when you're born and raised with a silver spoon in your mouth plus maybe 10 silver spoons in your mouth, you may not quite have the motivation to take the risks to come up with the ideas. But there are plenty of non-nationals who were very, very eager and in effect, you know, creating some of the pathways. So for example, in the UAE, a lot of people are familiar with the Burj Al Khalifa, which is the tallest building in Dubai. Very few people know that that was both designed, architected, and the power systems were developed by non-national, not Emirati, but you know, res Emirati residents 
who built that whole thing. I mean, again, entrepreneurs who are doing real estate development, who are doing systems you know, integration, who are doing a whole range of things that will forge a path. And the day when these countries and their nationals can rely on the stipends that the government gives them or you know, uh, salaries that it pays them for doing not much, and there, that there is such a problem there among some, um, you know, it's going to be over. I mean, it's not going to go on forever. We know that the energy balance is shifting, and so will the you know, economic balance. And so I think we'll see changes come about. But that aside, the other trend is what Chris is talking about, which you have a lot, you know, you do have a tier of highly educated, um, you know, highly connected young people who are seeing the rest of the world, whether they've been there themselves or whether they've seen it online, and they can't resist the energy and the excitement and the new ideas that they're seeing. And so they're the ones who are stepping in to um, fill in some of these gaps. So I, I think we'll see, you know, it's, I think we're still early in this movement, even though, to Chris's point, it's a lot further than you might imagine, and maybe you saw some of it, but, uh, I, you know, we all think it's incredibly exciting. Yeah. So. You. As for my question, well, well, being the one, uh, you know, when you said what you said before about how American diplomats go there and say, we bring you entrepreneurship, um, you know, we did always like to say and do like to say that entrepreneurship is the best part of the American brand, which isn't to say that we invented it. Uh, it isn't to say that nobody else does it, but I think we, we are recognized for it. But in, in the spirit of that, though, I'd like to ask you, what, what is the biggest thing American entrepreneurs can learn from what is going on in the region? So it's a wonderful. It is a wonderful question, and I think she's right. It's a very important sensitivity, because I'm not a political expert. Many of you know much more than I do about this. But it is you don't have to be a world traveler to know, even being over there briefly, that we seem to have successfully angered an incredibly wide spectrum of people <laughs> in many countries. Um, having said that, the exception is what you're talking about, right? Anyone who would give me hell about something that we. I mean, this, this one guy, and I love him. He's a very good friend, but he keeps referring to the Iraq invasion is my invasion. He literally, you are, you know, he personalizes them, you know. Um, but by God, they want to know about Silicon Valley and they want to know about entrepreneurs in New York and Washington, D.C. and whatever else. And so she's absolutely right. They don't, there's no hesitancy, no pause. It is that co-authorship of people who are thinking about things in the same way. You know, I think that there's a lot to be able to learn because I believe, as Mark suggested, that if we are in fact entering a world of five billion smartphones, that means it's a world that most of us don't really understand at all and haven't made the patience to understand it. I can't tell you in my interview of really brilliant Silicon Valley people whose technology, in fact, has been building this phenomenon, many of whom have had operations in emerging markets for 10 or 15 years, tend to look at them in their terms. And what I mean by that, look, as I've got to have an office in China because it's so big, I may lose a lot, but I've got to be there because it's China. Me, me, me. I've got to outsource in India because it's cheaper than the way I can do it here. You know, me, me, me as opposed to really thinking to themselves, man, what's being unleashed is something that's happening bottom up over there that we have to engage in. So the best learning that I think that we can do here is one, is an appreciation that the world is shifting in very powerful ways. And that opportunity is a co-authorship. It's not a me, me, me. It's not a win, a negotiation. It is, I got a lot I can bring to the table that you will find of value, is saying, but you on the other hand have unbelievable stuff to teach me. Let's co-author some very, very big wins together. And that's a mind frame that I see sometimes beautifully but nowhere near enough for where I think the world is going. Uh, my name is Jay Smith. I run an undergraduate program in entrepreneurship at the University of Maryland. Um, I don't have that much experience in that region, but I do have an experience doing an internet startup in another country that um, really was very hierarchical as well as ostracized half their population, and that was Japan. Um, so there's a similar situation going on there. Um, I'm wondering, and the, the, the challenge that we face, and we are actually, that was good for us because we ended up hiring, you know, roughly half our staff was women, and the other half was representing about 12 other countries uh, in Japan. But what is the other, the rest of the ecosystem like there in terms of finance, uh, legal, other issues that the entrepreneurs have to deal with? Nascent, writ large. We also have an ability, I think, to look at the region as a region while what is going on in Damascus is obviously different than what's going on in the Doha and is different than what's going on in Dubai. And there, there's a lot of time being spent on this. And, and some of the basic rule of law stuff is an unbelievable challenge. So for example, as I said before, I think e-commerce is going to be an unbelievable opportunity for entrepreneurs there and is. But every country has its own mind-numbing regulations to move products. As one of the lawyers over there told me, imagine creating Amazon.com with all 50 states having their own customs, their own triplicate stuff, 
different fees and structures, that kind of stuff. And so efforts to be able to come at that are not moving fast enough. There are unbelievable opportunities there. What I can't give you a prediction on, but is so interesting to me, is that so much of the ecosystem that is being developed there is also happening bottom up. Supplemental education, programming, training of programmers, kind of an autodidact approach, which is incredibly important. There is a amazing amount of what we in the trade call angel dollars that are available now, which were not available even three years ago, which is early, early money to help out. There's been some tradition of financing in private equity, which is highly successful, larger cash flow businesses get investments. But that in between, this is a real problem. And as anyone who follows this stuff in America, it's all well to get to your first year and show success, but that's when you need $2 million, $3 million, whatever, to take it to the next level. But as I'm standing here before you, I've got two perspectives back at home of people raising hundred or multi-hundred million dollar funds to go with that. So it's nascent, it's got challenges, but people are looking at it in very serious ways within region and more and more from externally. It's a great question though. Jacques, it's great to see you. Thank you for being Chris, here. Chris, I'm thrilled to, to hear your views. Um, um, I have two hypotheses. would love to hear your, w what you think about this. Is this entrepreneurial spirit something that gets compartmentalized and the social and political um, currents remain the same and separate from this? Or is there a more hopeful narrative that the entrepreneurial spirit is breaking down uh, some of the sectarian separation violence, Sunni Shiite or even Muslim Israel? How do you see that? It's going to take a while. The sectarian difficulties are serious, and they manifest themselves in very powerful ways. The same kids at the American University of Beirut who talked to me about WASTA told me in the first week at this incredibly elite university of higher learning that within that first week almost everyone had named who was of what sect in that area overall. Some parts of Iraq outside of the Kurdish area that have been successful have been Basra, but Basra is Shiite only, right? So there are these issues. I think that technology breaks down these borders in very powerful ways, but it takes time and it takes trust building in ways. A lot of people come to me and I can tell you it scares the hell out of my friends over there and say, oh, this is going to be the solution to peace in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And my friends who are in this are like, don't talk about that. Do not politicize what we're doing. If we build successful businesses and get great talent cross-border, that's great. That can happen with time, but that's not what this is about. This is about building businesses and the rest has got to take care of itself. This um, incubator that is also part of the venture group that Leslie's part of it, set up a rule, it's a brilliant idea. They set up one fundamental rule when they set up their incubator. No politics, no religion. Don't talk about it, don't bring it up, save it for somewhere else. Here we've got one mission overall. And I think with that, some pretty remarkable things culturally and socially will happen, but it's gonna take time. These are very deep issues. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody.